Well, good morning, everyone. Let's get started. My name is Laura Geckler, as most of you know, and I will be moderating this session. Today is Thursday, June the 18th, 2020, and we are in day four of the Open Aperio Virtual Conference. Before we get, begin, a few reminders. The session is being recorded. You will receive an email announcement once the recordings are available. If you have any questions or comments throughout the session, please type them into the chat area. Or if you have a microphone, feel free to ask your questions or make comments aloud during the QA part of the session. We do ask that you mute yourself if you're not speaking in order to avoid extraneous background noises and clicky keyboards. <laughs> The presenters for this session are Jennifer Ludiana and Mary Beth Messner. Jennifer is the Director of User Support and Classroom Technology in Information Technology Services at Walsh University in North Canton, Ohio. She's been the Sakai Administrator for the past six years. In addition to being the Sakai Administrator, her IT duties include managing the help desk and project management for some of the enterprise software that any of the users might be working with. In her spare time, she hangs out with her dog, Oscar, and her husband, Brian, and loves to cook and watch crime drama shows. <laughs> Mary Beth Messner is a learning and development professional with over six years of experience in teaching and training audiences in academic, corporate, and healthcare setting, settings. She joined Walsh's University's digital campus in 2019 and is focused on cultivating a renewed emphasis on quality matters standards. Under Mary Beth's leadership this past year, Walsh University earned three Quality Matters course certifications. Mary Beth's specialties include instructional design, teaching and facilitation, educational technology, online learning, education management, leadership development, and employee training. Mary Beth loves polka dots, the beach, and anything written by Ellen Hildebrand. She and her family also live in North Canton, Ohio. Today's presentation is brought to you by the Atlas Awards Task Force, or the Aperio Teaching and Learning Awards. This year, they decided that an additional award is appropriate to recognize the efforts of institutions and organizations who were making to enable faculty and students who are being forced online to make the transitions they need while maintaining high learning standards and institutional visions. At Waltz University during the spring portion of the ongoing pandemic, when students were home, all courses were required to move online and to use tools within Sakai to teach courses. 184 faculty converted 455 courses to distance learning in approximately a day and a half. Please welcome Jennifer and Mary Beth to tell Walsh's story. Take it away, ladies. Hi, welcome everyone. Um, I'm Jennifer and I will be talking about our journey uh, to converting our face-to-face -face courses um, to remote learning uh, from about mid-spring semester until uh, the end of the spring semester. Uh, one of the things I want to note, <clears throat> excuse me, is that this is a collaboration of two different groups. Um, as my bio had said, um, I am in information technology, which reports up through the vice president of administration. Uh, Mary Beth is part of our digital campus that reports through the vice president of enrollment up through the provost side. So we both work together as well as with all of our faculty and staff to make this a successful project in moving from face to face to remote learning. So let me tell you a little bit about Walsh. Uh, Walsh University is a Catholic university in North Canton, Ohio. We have a 136 acre campus. Um, we have about 2600 students that's graduate and undergraduates and we have 40 students from 40 states and 35 countries. Um, our digital campus offers accelerated online programs or hybrid programs through Sakai, which is also called ECN, our electronic course network. Um, Walsh was founded in 1960, so we're just now celebrating our 60th anniversary as a university. 
And just for some general information as we go forward, we are currently on Sakai 19.3, which we will call ECN throughout. That's what we call that instance. And we will be moving to 19.4 next week. And we're hoping to upgrade to 20 in December. So that's kind of where we are, uh, what version we're on for your reference. So just to give you an idea of what it looked like before the COVID-19 changes. Um, <clears throat> so we have three areas we look at here. So our help desk had approximately 40 tickets regarding ECN per month. Um, our ECN instance held about 64 fully online courses. So these are the courses that are fully online or hybrid through the digital campus. Um, and just as a note, we do load all of our courses into ECN and all of the enrollments. So those are all there. If faculty choose to use them or use parts of them, I know in my class, I do use assignments tool. I use a few things in ECN, they can. Um, also, we use Zoom. We are a Zoom school and we had about 115 users and that includes the pro accounts and the basic accounts. Basic accounts are what our students get. They're free. They have about 40 minutes um, of meeting time. And then we have pro accounts that we've purchased through Zoom that are unlimited time and have some other features that faculty and staff can use. And we had over about 400 meetings a month. So that's to give you an idea of what it looked like before we had to make the quick switch. So a little bit about our timeline. Uh, so this started in early March. So we posted our response on the website uh, around March 4th and we had students come back from spring break on the 6th. So this all happened after our spring break. I know some schools um, it happened before and then they had spring break or it happened during as well. Um, we suspended our face-to-face -face instruction on Tuesday, March 10th. We announced that. Um, and then on the 13th is when we had faculty go back and start teaching remotely on Friday the 13th. That's not a good day, but it worked out well for us. <laughs> um, and then our faculty staff started working at home. We had a stay at home order in the state of Ohio. Uh, so they started to work at home as well. And then um, March 20th, uh, our administration had decided to cancel our commencement. And the reason for that, our commencement was very early. Our commencement was April 26th. And we had already sent students home from the residence hall. So if international students were graduating or out of state students, they probably would not be coming back uh, based on what was going to happen with the pandemic. So they determined that it would be in everyone's best interest to cancel our commencement. So moving online, that's the big topic. So we had a two day turnaround. We announced it on the 10th. The 11th and 12th, we canceled classes so that students could get moved out and settled. Faculty could start working on their plan uh, for remote teaching. Uh, so we had a two day turnaround. So M Mary Beth and I both visited every academic department. We talked about basics of ECN. We talked about strategies. Um, how to get your information, you know, from paper format into ECN. We stressed a lot of the tools that would be quick for them to bring up. So using resources, creating folders, um, using assignments for turning in items, um, announcements, messages, some of those basic tools um, to be using. And originally we thought it was going to be two to three weeks and it ended up being the whole rest of the semester. Uh, so we kind of were on a quick turnaround there and also faculty uh, could have synchronous instruction. So we did talk about Zoom, how to use Zoom, the best uh, features for that as well. So our snapshot. So before I gave you some of the before numbers, you'll see those in the first column. Um, also, I put some of the after numbers. So these numbers are based on a six to eight week time period from when we started. Uh, our remote instruction March 11th through the end of the semester. So you can see the percentage change. So our monthly tickets went from 40 to about 150 a month just on ECN. Uh, we had over 1200 tickets a month on just anything. So that would be Zoom, any other topic. So all of our tickets went up. 
Um, our online courses, we had 64. Um, the 630 here is all courses. Um, so that included um, anything that was uh, internships, courses by arrangement, all of that as well. So we went from having 64 using it all the time to six, over 600 courses using it. Um, and you can see here our Zoom use skyrocketed as well from about 400 meetings to 1,500. Um, so just so you can get an idea of, of the huge impact in that change of moving from having a lot of face-to-face -to, -face to everything online. So how did we do it? We had a nice small team that was very mighty. Um, so for spring semester, we had 184 faculty and that included our full-time faculty, which is about 135, 140, and then all of our adjunct instructors. Um, so we had two instructional designers, one of which was Mary Beth, myself, um, the ECN administrator, and then my help desk staff, which are about two, we have two full-time and one three-quarter time help desk technicians that were answering calls, emails, tickets, um, talking with people, getting them set up and running, uh, answering questions, fielding questions for us as we went through this process. We did put out a lot of resources and we offered as much training as we could. Uh, we had some training, as I said, back on those two days that uh, classes were canceled. We did some mini training um, in those sessions, but we also developed some job aids uh, very quickly on ECN. We also guided people to the ECN help. We created a web page. Um, if you click on that, it'll show you the uh, page that we have. It had synchronous instruction tips, asynchronous, ECN tips, tips for um, giving tests, uh, all kinds of anything that we could get that was good for the faculty and they could peruse it at their own leisure. We also created one for students because some students had never had to use ECN very much. Maybe they never turned in an assignment. They've never taken a test online. So that was also another site that we created so that uh, students would have a little bit of help as well. I can bring that over, Jennifer. Oh, okay. So this was our page that we created. Um, so it had a link to the president's information, our website on the coronavirus. It had the site updates um, as we, because we are doing them almost every, every other day. So we felt that having a option there, you can see Adobe Creative Cloud added a free version. We linked to that. Um, new things on teaching and learning. Um, our links to our office hours for faculty were here. And then information on remote working. Uh, which was for staff and faculty because maybe they weren't used to working at home. Uh, so they had some tips there, teaching and learning resources, ECN I had mentioned, and then if you scroll down there's some things on asynchronous, synchronous instruction. So we offered that and we loaded it almost every day. Uh, we had new links, we had new guides uh, for our faculty to use. And again, we have a smaller version of this that was loaded for students because we were starting to get questions. Did I upload my assignment? I click submit, is it there? Um, I don't know where to find this or that and how to navigate them through as well. And that one's a lot, was a lot shorter, but it was there for students as well. And we called it the classroom continuity project because that was the goal. The goal at the time was to make the face-to-face -face just continue through online and try to make it as continuous and easy as possible for students and make it as smooth as we could for faculty. We also had um, Zoom office hours, which were on that page. Uh, we had a help desk drop-in. So we have a help desk office you can just walk in and we realized, well, if people are used to walking in, they might feel more comfortable even if they could just drop in. So we had an open Zoom session all day and they could just drop in, ask questions. If they dropped in at the same time as the faculty office hours, we could kind of guide them back and forth as well. Uh, we offered extended help desk hours. We were open 13 hours a day. Uh, both of my full-time or two of the help desk techs were at home and one of them was in the office. We felt that we should have someone there during the peak time so that they could answer the phone. Um, our phone system was not transferable 
um, like a call center would be. So we use that as our option. We also encourage people when you call, leave a message, and then we call people right back and answer their question. And all of those calls actually came into our ticketing system. So that was nice because then we could document who it was, what did they need. You know, you could have all that information there together at one time. Um, and then I would send out usually about two times a week um, tips and tricks emails. So I called them the IT almost dailies because they came out so often. And they would have any common calls we got, any a lot of questions about things, I'd put them all in there and send them out more frequently so that they didn't have these huge emails that they had to read. Uh, they could actually um, just see these short snippets, they could save them, um, and they were ready for them to go. And I'll show you some examples of those um, as we go. Uh, the Zoom faculty office hours, uh, Mary Beth and I offered them twice a day in the morning and the evening. Um, they were staffed by each of us, and we had quite a few folks drop in um, to get some help or they had questions. I set up my test, can you check it for me? Um, or I need to set up a test, what's the best way to do that? Um, how do I use assignments? Uh, a lot of things like that. And then just an idea, our drop-in hours um, were from 8 to 9 p.m. Uh, we had those staffed with th our three uh, staff members from the help desk um, so that they could drop in if they felt that was easier for someone to do that instead of calling and talking them through on the phone. The other nice thing about Zoom is there is a remote control option that you can turn on that allows our help desk folks that can take control of someone's computer and they can help them. So we use that a lot for Zoom troubleshooting. Um, troubleshooting when folks had issues with browsers, uh, things like that. So we can use Zoom for that now too, um, to get some remote access. Just a couple examples of the emails. This is one of the first ones that was sent out uh, probably around the end of March, early April. Uh, this one had all the help desk information in it. It's kind of small, but if you look at the slideshow, you should be able to uh, blow it up. Uh, cybersecurity, apparently a pandemic is a time when everyone wants to spam and fish. So we had some information to remind students, faculty and staff about that. Uh, and then Zoom bombing was popular then. So we had some tips and tricks that I had gotten from uh, Zoom. They started having a weekly uh, Zoom webinar that you could sit in on and they would talk about updates, changes they made so that uh, you could uh, have that information. And so I gave them a lot of that information too uh, to help them uh, with protecting their Zoom sessions that they had. And then another example, this one was sent towards the end of the semester around finals week. So this gives a lot of information uh, for new alumni, uh, gives information on Microsoft Stream. We are an Office 365 school. Uh, so we use Stream a lot to store videos. It creates transcripts. It's been a pretty good tool for us. Also on Respondus, um, how to launch it, how to use it to take a test, some other tips so that you can make sure it works correctly. And then lastly, information on the faculty office hours, help desk hours, all of that. Um, and I still publish these once a week now. At the end of the week, I usually send out uh, any updates. I send out help desk hours because during the summer, hours change a little bit um, with us not being on campus. So now I'm going to turn it over to Mary Beth, and she is going to talk about our training and some of our other online initiatives that we did for campus. Thanks, Jennifer. Yeah, you know, exactly what Jennifer said. This was really a multifaceted approach, you know, not just the IT tech training piece um, and having that constant communication, but all units across campus really collaborated to make sure we were putting our students first in this transition from a face-to-face -face, um, classroom environment to the remote learning. One of the things that we did in May um, was our May Day's training sessions. So as Jennifer previously mentioned, you know, our semester ends fairly early. Spring semester concludes in April typically, and we were supposed to have our commencement ceremonies at the end of April. Faculty are on contracts through mid-May, so we have what's called May Days every year where we offer um, some professional development in-house at Walsh. And this year, the May Days training sessions focused um, specifically on online learning. Because of the experience we had in converting with COVID, we really wanted to make sure that faculty felt prepared going into our summer session. All of our summer courses are online right now for our summer sessions. Um, looking ahead to fall, we'll see what the future holds. We're hoping to be back on campus 
But regardless of what's coming, we wanted to make sure our faculty are prepared. I offered four days of three hour training sessions. And these were, again, offered via Zoom. Normally they'd be offered face to face on campus, but we did them via Zoom. Um, and the topics that we included were mapping your course, creating engaging content, communicating from a distance, and assessing learning online. So these courses were both a blend of how to use Sakai. Like Jennifer mentioned, you know, we had some faculty who were very familiar and had taught on online courses, um, either as traditional undergrad or as part of our digital campus programs that are meant for um, ex or accelerated programs for adult learners. Um, you know, but there are some faculty who used ECN to load their syllabus or use the gradebook feature or include their assignments, but most of our, there are a good, good majority of our faculty that were not familiar with how to use ECN. So it was a blend of, you know, regardless of what the future holds, if we're going to be fully online, if we're going to be doing remote learning and it's more of a high flex format, or regardless of what we're, you know, hoping to do, even if we are face to face, how can you use ECN and Sakai to support your classes? So with mapping your course, as Jennifer mentioned, um, you know, I do focus on quality matters on campus. So with mapping your course, we focused on creating a course map and talked about how we can meet QM standards using what we have in Sakai. Um, we've created a course template. It's a course that we, we have course sites set up and then we are able to import those sites into faculty upon request. Um, it has eight lessons, typically for digital campus, but we did have a 15 week version available at the time. Um, Walsh has since transitioned to eight week sessions across campus where we'll no longer be offering a traditional 15 week semester. But at the time we did have those versions um, and it just created a outline, you know, where each lesson, there would be one lesson per week. Um, faculty could include an overview stating what the topic was going to be. They could enter learning objectives, load readings and instructional content and other materials and then link to assignments and other things. And again, this was very new for many faculty members. Those who hadn't taught online weren't familiar with the online template. So presenting this session allowed them to see how they could organize the course now that they had more time to plan. Obviously, when we were moving online in a matter of 48 hours, um, that was not a possibility to look at using this template. But you know, looking to summer and fall, faculty have a little more time to get acclimated and prepare. So that's where that template would come into play. Um, and like I mentioned, that would be using the lessons tool in Sakai Whereas when we were going to remote learning, we were actually recommending not using the lessons tool in the template and just sticking to loading files and resources and using like tests and quizzes discussions, um, gradebook and assignments for those purposes. So that was our first session. Creating engaging content talked about three types of engagement. We looked at learner content interaction, learner instructor interaction, and learner learner interaction and how we can still create the same camaraderie that you experience in a face-to-face -face course in an online environment. We also talked about the challenges of remote learning and making sure that content was accessible for all learners um, and that we were also addressing equity as well. You know, some of our students, we have a lot good international student population, making sure that all of our students had access to internet and that classroom continuity site that Jennifer shared earlier, as well as the um, IT newsletter that she would send out, regularly shared resources for how students could obtain, um, you know, internet through Comcast and I think Spectrum and some of our other services, um, just promoting things for students to make this transition easier for them. So we looked at creating engaging content. We talked about communicating from a distance. This talked about best practices for communication, obviously the basics of netiquette, but also looking at how can you create interactive sessions. So many of our faculty were still relying on Zoom and hosting these synchronous sessions. So we talked about both asynchronous communication and synchronous communication. We looked at tools in Sakai, including the announcements tool and how to leverage that, as well as how to build um, meaningful discussions that encourage people to interact through the discussions tool. And finally, when we looked at assessing learning online, this um, addressed different types of assessments. You know, there's some challenges. I think many faculty um, are comfortable with offering quizzes and tests that are multiple choice. So we talked about the challenges of moving that online, um, as well as just best practices for assessment, looking at alternative assessments, incorporating formative assessments in your online courses. So those sessions were offered. We also offered a Zoom training session. Like we mentioned, Zoom was really 
really exploding on campus for us because we had so many faculty suddenly utilizing it. So Jennifer provided a great session that talked about upgrades on security and changes to the interface. You know, as people were getting on Zoom, Zoom was upgrading and editing things, you know, by the week. So Jennifer wanted to communicate those changes to campus. And she also shared some interactive options, such as using the whiteboard um, and just how to, you know, really make the most of every Zoom faculty and students. I mentioned this we was have a five minutes. We have five okay. minutes. I'll talk fast. Thanks, Laura. You know, as I mentioned, this is a multifaceted approach. So we have great communication at Walsh. You know, our president hosts town halls periodically where he touches base with the faculty and staff. Those are called CAV calls. But we also have the Walsh Wire. If you're unable to attend a CAV call, the Walsh Wire is a bi-weekly internal newsletter that highlights different things happening on campus. You know, we look at on campus, I know, being the joke since we were all remote at this time, but different things that were happening with the faculty and staff, offering shout outs and success stories of, you know, faculty and students and what they were doing through these challenges. It also offered news and updates. Like Jennifer mentioned, we originally thought we were going to be remote for two to three weeks and it was much more. Different units across campus also supported the students in creating that classroom feel. Um, and the student life. So our campus ministry, Jennifer mentioned we are a Catholic university. Our campus ministry used Zoom for daily mass, rosary, socials, and prayer sessions. Our student life um, was really fairly lively considering, you know, we had trivia contests, social media posts, Instagram live dance parties with a DJ, TikTok contests. We had a whole student appreciation week um, in April that you could see some of the different things that we presented. There were links to Netflix movie parties, um, self-care challenges. So there was like meditation sessions that people could log into. It was really great. And that, you know, I think it's so important to consider that it was not just the academic piece of moving online. It's also this student life piece as well to making sure our students were supported and felt comfortable, even though this was not a typical semester for them, we did what we could. Um, and because we're short on time, I'll just highlight some of these success stories fairly quickly. You know, we talked with so many faculty during these office hours. So, you know, for example, the instructor of COM365, she's used to students doing face-to-face -face presentations for her communications course. So we talked about how students could use Zoom to present online. And there was a great collaboration. Jennifer mentioned these slides will be posted in the discussion forum for our presentation. So I encourage you to go look at their video that they created and um, this project of Walk with the President that was a collaboration, a community service learning project with the McKinley Presidential Library and Museum. We had some other examples, you know, of just learning to use the tools. We had an anatomy instructor that Jennifer worked with who um, was used to using paper images and was transferred to a hotspot. We had our music department contacting us transition and still recreate those vocal performances online. There's a beautiful link here. I encourage you to check out their um, Be Not Afraid performance. Um, and like I said, just moving fairly quickly through this, we are online for summer session, fall planning. We're looking ahead and just being ready and flexible with whatever the future holds for us. We're hoping to be on campus. That's the plan. But if we need to go remote, we know from this experience that we're able to do so. Thank you, Mary Beth. We have a couple questions in the in the chat, and uh, I think I'll go ahead and read those to you. Um, let's see. I'll try and take them in order of general in interest, since this is something that we have all gone through. Uh, what positives have come out of the COVID era? Do you find that faculty and students are more technologically savvy? Are there plans to offer more fully online or hybrid courses post COVID? I think, you know, I mentioned that the culture on campus, I think there's some hesitancy. And the electronic course network, you know, certainly the members of digital campus are faculty who teach through us, but I think now faculty are definitely more comfortable using it. We've seen a definite increase in people asking for the course template that I mentioned, just so they can plan ahead for fall. Um, you know, and also looking at the existing courses we have online and just saying, you know, can I see what's already out there and maybe I want to use that for this fall. So it's definitely helping to change the culture at Walsh. So I would consider that a positive. When you mentioned templates, I think there's some confusion uh, represented in the chat by lessons. Were these templates lessons based? Yes, um, so it's lessons based. I can pull it over. Actually, let me 
so you know. were so you were recommending lessons uh, in the May days, but previous to that, you didn't want to get into lessons. Why was that complexity? Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> you know, we, we did convert in 48 hours. And for someone who hasn't used ECN before, explaining how to use the different tools, um, there were a lot of faculty who were overwhelmed, frankly. And we didn't want to add to their stress by suggesting lessons. I can show you very quickly. This is what our course template looks like. Um, we click on the lessons tool. You'll see that we have this is the eight week template. So we have it set up and then within each lesson you can click and we have an overview objectives, space to link content assignments would be linked and tests and quizzes above this checklist. We have the checklist so students can keep track and then space for additional resources. So this mm -hmm. is a little overwhelming for a faculty who's not used to ECN. So this is why we waited until May days to offer this training and make this available. That is beautiful. Uh, would the two of you be available in uh, in our conference site to lead some discussions so we can continue the conversation? Uh, <laughs> sure, sure. I don't know where we would go, but uh, it's uh, in Tri Sakai. The uh, the discussions tab on the left hand side uh, has a has a discussion set up for this where you'll post your slides or have posted your slides as I understand it. Sure, the slides are posted there. Um, Jennifer also wanted us to share that we are available via email as well. If people want to reach out to us with questions following the conference, you know, we're certainly happy to assist you as well. Thank you so much. I'm going to stop the recording now.